uh, today we are going to continue talking about results in deep learning generalizations. All right, so last time we uh, started talking about uh, Zhang ETL paper, really good paper. I encourage all of you to uh, read it. So just to recap about the results of that paper that we covered. So they performed this randomization test. Uh, if you have a training set, xi, yi, say you have n training samples, what they do is that they uh, rand they randomly shuffle the labels or uh, you know they, they have some other experiments that they can partially you know shuffle the labels. Uh, let's say we are looking at the full random case. So the labels uh, are uh, fully random in the case that we covered. And we saw that in this case, okay, the model is going to have a very poor generalization because my test error is going to be half in the binary classification case because there is no structure between X and Y relationships. My training error uh, is going to be very small, which was very surprising. That shows the neural network has uh, capacity, has complexity in order to uh, fit to random labels. And that basically indicated, even though here we have a large generalization, generalization gap is half, that indicated that some of the um, complexity measures that we uh, you know, discussed last time, for example, Radar marker complexity. Or VC dimension, they are not sufficient to explain uh, the behavior, the generalization behavior in deep learning to explain generalization behavior in deep learning. And I'm emphasizing on not sufficient, right? So there is still pretty useful complexity measures, but there may be some other things going on in the, uh, in training deep models. Uh, for instance, you may have some implicit regularizations or some other uh, factors that also contribute to the good generalization behavior that we observe oftentimes uh, in deep learning. Okay. All right, so another interesting observation in the paper is the following. So you may think that, okay, if you have random labels, then uh, neural network is uh, going to, the optimization of neural network is going to have some difficulty to, uh, you know, basically converge to a good solution. And maybe we can use some um, convergence rates or some properties of the trajectories of uh, SGD in order to say, to basically to talk about generalization uh, behavior of neural networks. But what they have observed is that, in fact, the neural network optimization is not much more difficult uh, if you train on random labels in terms of uh, convergence rate. Uh, they have like, uh, they have shown like, you know, it may be like two or three times slower uh, on average, but it is not like uh, significantly uh, slower than if you train your neural network on true labels of your uh, data. So it's a very neat observation. So let me just summarize this. Neural network optimization is not uh, much more difficult training on random labels. So in terms of like, for instance, in terms of conversions, rate, etc. Right. So, therefore, we cannot use this measure. Uh, cannot explain generalizability 
uh, by itself. Right? So it is not sufficient, again, just to look at, for instance, the rate of convergence or some of uh, measures that we uh, got from the training of the neural network in order to explain the generalization behavior. All right, so this shows, okay, we cannot use, you know, complexity measures, right, rather marker complexity or VC dimension that only depends on the hypothesis class. Also, probably we cannot use just the uh, behavior of the, you know, training optimization of neural network in order to um, explain the generalization behavior of neural networks. And they also looked into the role of explicit regularization. Okay, so far we have uh, trained neural networks using ERM. So no regularization is there, but we can add regularization. Right? So what kind of you know, regularizations people they use in practice? You can uh, do data augmentation, which is a very common way of adding regularization. For example, you are adding random uh, cropping of your images to your training. You add like different maybe, you know, uh, you know uh, lighting or something else to your training set. And then, um, you know, uh, this acts as an explicit regularization. Or you can do like an L2 regularization or uh, what it is called, weight decay. Weight decay, which is basically the L2 regularization on parameters. Or you can do a dropout. So dropout, you basically randomly drop, dropping out some of the, you know, either nodes, neurons, or some of the edges. And it acts as another form of explicit regularization in your, uh, in your training. All right, so they have tried uh, these uh, explicit regularizations and obviously they observe that these, uh, adding these uh, explicit regularizations help generalization, right? So the generalization improves because you are restricting your uh, search space, but even without the model is still generalized as well. Right, so although like adding an explicit generalization, uh, explicit regularization is helpful to reduce the gap between your training and test laws, but it is not necessary. Right? So without even them, your model uh, has a pretty good generalization. Okay, just to summarize, basically uh, explicit regularization helps, but not necessary. So we, even without, without them, they have shown that models have pretty good generalization. All right, so now you may uh, think that, okay, even though if, we, if uh, in, in the case that we don't have an explicit regularization, it may be the case that when we are solving my ERM using a stochastic gradient descent, it may add some implicit regularization uh, to or optimization, and maybe that's why uh, we have a good generalization. So one conjecture would be one reason would be some implicit regularization by SGD. All right, so we studied this two lectures ago, uh, two lectures ago for linear models. And in fact, in, for linear models, we show that SGD, uh, say using logistic laws, uh, converges to uh, max margin solution, which is basically the L2 uh, regularization on the base, and that uh, has uh, a pretty good generalization. But in uh, general uh, model, it is still not uh, obvious what types of implicit regularization SGD is causing. Obviously, for a more general neural network, it doesn't converge to the max margin solution, 
and that's something that we'll discuss in the robustness uh, lectures. Uh, but there are some reasons to believe that SGD plays an important role in finding a solution with a good generalization uh, behavior. Okay, so that's it for uh, the results of this paper. So uh, I also covered the basically the expressive uh, power of neural networks uh, last time that basically showed that it is more practical to talk about the uh, you know expressive power of neural networks on samples. And so uh, in contrast to a lot of previous works that they look at the entire domain and they show, for instance, you need exponentially many number of neurons in order to uh, universally represent smooth functions, but they show that if you have n samples, uh, what you need is roughly speaking, you know, some constant times n plus d, which is the dimension, number of neurons in order to explain, in order to represent any uh, labelings in, um, in the data, which is an interesting uh, observation. Okay, so that's it for uh, this paper. So I'll pause and take your questions. I see there are some questions. The posted, is the behavior also applicable for multi-class? Yes. In fact, uh, they uh, look into CIFAR 10 data set, which is which basically a 10-class you know, class classification problem. And also they look into uh, ImageNet, uh, which has uh, 1,000 uh, label. So there are small differences between the results, but the, roughly speaking, the broad messages that I explained in this lecture holds for these cases as well. Okay, any other questions? I see some people, they have raised their hands. Um, maybe it, it is from the previous time or maybe it is... Um, okay, Amir, go ahead. So do you think the um, intricate multi-layer structure of neural networks is an implicit regularizer by itself? For instance, if we had a, we know that polynomials can interpolate if you have a good condition number. If you had a very high degree polynomial, do you suspect that it could interpolate the random labels? Right, so, um, you know, the answer in general is no, right? Because here uh, with these experiments, we have seen that, uh, Basically, the you know even with the one hidden layer MLP, uh, we can fit random labels. So they don't uh, impose some restrictions or some regularization in general. But perhaps the structure coupled with the uh, solver, with the optimization solver, uh, converges to a solution with some uh, implicit regularization that leads to better generalization. Uh, Tasneem, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering if this randomized only works for uh, class labels or is this extended to data, uh, data points also? Like if you randomly change in data points, will this also applicable? Right. Uh, it works uh, either way. I believe in the paper they have looked into uh, basically some adding noise to X's as well. Uh, and I believe there are some follow-up works on that, but it works either way. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so there's a question in the chat box. Um, how is SGD regularizing the model? Is it simply because we tend to get to some suboptimal solution? Uh, yeah, we discussed the implicit uh, bias of SGD for linear models. Uh, it is not like, uh, you know, trivial to uh, say, you know, SGD uh, ends up in a suboptimal solution. In fact, you know, SGD uh, finds in an over-parameterized regime a very good solution that achieves, you know, basically zero training error. So that's basically global uh, minima for your optimization. Uh, but at least on linear model, we showed that uh, if you use like some loss functions like logistics and if you apply SGD, you know, obviously under some conditions that we discussed, basically SGD converges to the max margin solution. And that's basically uh, the implicit regularization that SGD has there. In general, there are some uh, results that extend that observation to simple neural networks or some um, 
other models like uh, random Fourier features, uh, but that's something that uh, we still don't have the complete uh, picture yet. Okay, great. Um, Right, so if you uh, ask your questions, maybe you lower your hands just to make sure that I know like uh, which uh, uh, which hands are uh, more recent. Okay, so that's it for this paper. So let's uh, move on. So. Last time I talked about this bias variance trade-off, which is a classical view to think about the trade-off between the risk and the complexity of the class. So we had bias variance trade-off. So what was that trade-off? We argued that, okay, so, if my x-axis represent the complexity of my hypothesis class H, I'll, and I have risk in my y-axis, I'll have two regimes. Basically, if I increase my complexity of H, my training error is going to decrease. Let's say this is my training error, it's gonna basically go to zero if you increase the complexity of your function class, training error. But your test error uh, is going to increase and altogether you're going to have a behavior like this. And this is the test error. So the reason we have a decrease here is that we are reducing the bias term, right? So we, we are increasing the complexity, we are reducing the bias term, uh, and the variance term doesn't increase much, so overall the risk uh, is being reduced, but here we are overfitting. So the variance term is uh, dominating the reduction in the bias term, and we are seeing an increase in the test error. So this regime uh, is often called underfitting. And the bias term is still large and we can decrease it. And this regime is called overfitting. Okay, so this is the picture that uh, oftentimes in um, introduction to machine learning courses has been discussed. But we argued uh, last time that this picture is not complete. I'm not saying it is wrong, I'm saying it is uh, not complete. So there's a surprising observation, somehow surprising observation, by this paper that we posted on the course webpage, Belkin SUETL, 2019. That they basically try to have this plot to basically plot this empirically for some uh, some different hypothesis classes, including some neural networks. Let's say if you have a multi-layer perceptron, you can just in increase the complexity of H and see how your you know risk behaves. And they came up with a very interesting trend. Again, this is risk. Let's say this is the complexity of H. All right, so if you increase the complexity, then your training error is going to, at some point, is going to uh, become really small. So this is the training error. And then, yes, you do observe that uh, trade-off, the bias variance trade-off that we uh, explained uh, before. So you have basically when you're increasing your uh, complexity, you first decrease your risk because the bias term is uh, becoming smaller and then you increase it because the variance term, it becomes uh, smaller. 
But when you hit, roughly speaking, a zero training error, right? This is the regime that we talked in the first couple of lectures, the over-parameterization regime or the interpolation regime. This is the over-parameterization regime. And this is the under parameterization regime. Your training loss is still non-zero in the under parameterization regime. In, if you increase the complexity more, right? So you, you, you are able to achieve zero training error, then classically you didn't you know, have to increase the complexity of your uh, function class. You're already really good in your training, right? Your error is zero. So, and that's the reason that in many of the classical models, people, they have focused on just this part of the picture. But what they have uh, observed is that if you uh, make your model uh, more and more over-parameterized, then your, train, your test error starts to decrease again. So let me have this with another color, the same color actually. So, so this is again your test error. Right, so again, until the time that you hit the you know, zero training error, which is the under parameterized regime, you see the same behavior, the bias variance trade off from you know, the classical uh, results that we had. But when you hit the training, zero training error, you go into the over parameterized regime, interpolation regime, and you push your model to be more and more over parameterized. And what they observed empirically is that in that case, your test error starts to decrease again. And in many cases, it converges to a point that, this point that may be smaller than the point that you uh, have your minimum in the minimum risk, test risk in the under parameterized regime. So this is in many cases smaller than this minimum that you have here. So this behavior, which is uh, you know, quite surprising, uh, which was quite surprising at the time, it's called double descent behavior. or double descent curve. All right, so let me uh, pause here. Are there any questions? I have a quick question. Yes, please. Uh, so on this plot, we're not specifying what the complexity measure of H is. That's right, that's right. So it's vaguely defined at this point. Uh, you can think about, you know, one kind of rough measure, just a number of parameters for now. But, you know, you can think about some other, you know, more meaningful measures as well. Even if you just plot this with the number of parameters in your model, you will see these types of double descent behavior. Right, any other questions? I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, does this occur, so say number of parameters in a neural network, or if we had to say an SVM, for instance, a polynomial SVM, would we observe this as well? If we increase the number of parameters? Yes, yes. In fact, it, it is not specific to neural networks, right? So even in linear models, you can observe these types of behaviors if you push the model to over parameterized regime. Or if you think about like some uh, kernel methods or you know, random Fourier features, uh, you can observe the same thing. In all of those cases, you need to push your complexity to be in an over-parameterized regime and you can empirically observe a similar behavior. Mm. All right, so there is a question in the chat box. Um, could it be the case there, although there is a double descent curve, if we keep increasing the complexity, then the test error might uh, go up again. So in their experiments, they observe the double descent behavior, right? So you increase and then you decrease. I'll uh, briefly talk about some recent uh, results. 
that they show in fact you can somehow come up with some input output distributions that you may see you know maybe multiple descent or some different types of uh, behavior for your uh, for your test error those are also interesting but what is uh, i think uh, very significant uh, from this behavior so they have used some uh, standard data sets so here i think they have applied on you know svhn or cfar or some of these image data sets and they have observed this behavior so it is not a you know curated uh, distribution in order to come up with some interesting behavior in the in the test time so this is at this point it is purely an empirical observation All right, so there are a few more questions. Um, so which one would uh, give better accuracy for test data that are edge cases like uh, the fur covered spoon? Um, so I don't quite understand the question, but uh, if you are talking about the, uh, uh, the you know, minimum in the under parameterized and over parameterized case, oftentimes this minimum beats the, the minimum that you achieve in the under parameterized case. Okay, since there are infinite uh, solutions in the over parameterized regime, are we saying that any of these solutions achieve uh, this test error? That's a very good question. Uh, so I'll talk a, a little bit about that, uh, you know, in a minute. Hold on to that question. So one hidden thing in this plot is the input distribution. Yes, yes. So this is empirically observed, let's say for some um, image data sets or some particular distribution. So you may come up, as I mentioned, you may come up with some in, you know, uh, synthetic distributions that you observe other types of behaviors. But these behaviors uh, have been observed to some of the you know, image data sets that they have tried. What is the influence of the number of samples in this curve? Uh, yeah, the, the number of samples uh, kind of determine the regime that will have the over parameterization, right? So roughly speaking, if your number of parameters is the same as the number of samples, here when you have m is equal to n, then you hit this zero training error and then you go into the, you go into the uh, over parameterization uh, regime. Okay, so bias variance trade-off may also exist in over-parameterized regime uh, separately. Yes, that's, uh, I wouldn't call it bias variance trade-off, but you may not have monotonically decreasing um, test error. But that, I wanna emphasize, that is not something that has been observed on some natural, uh, you know, data sets like image data sets. So on image data sets, we have observed these double descent behavior, and that's what we are going to focus on. Okay, so there's another question. If we keep pushing into over parameterized regime and we get a second descent in the test error, then why would uh, we bother with uh, overfitting? Yes, we don't bother with overfitting at all. Right? So that's the whole um, you know, point here uh, that we, before we were really worried about um, overfitting. We were really worried about you know, this, the, the, the regime that we have uh, here. Uh, in classical training, saying that if you have, you know, 1,000 samples, you may uh, fit a model with 10 parameters to avoid going into the overfitting. But what this curve uh, shows is that maybe that's uh, not a right way to think about it. If you have 1,000 samples, fit a neural network with a million parameters, and then you will be in this regime. You are uh, in an over-parameterized uh, regime, your training error is zero, but you don't uh, suffer much from uh, generalization gap. And that's uh, quite uh, interesting and surprising uh, observation. Okay, so uh, I think I sampled uh, some of your questions. If you are missing something, maybe you can uh, repeat it later on. Let me move on. So let me first uh, say what is going on here in a more intuitive fashion, and then let's look at this problem in a simple linear model and see if we can analyze this behavior in a, a more precise way. So what is the intuition here? So 
the intuition is in fact really simple. Right? So we have in the overparameterized regime, we have a manifold as, you, as we have discussed in the first lectures, we don't have a unique solution. Right? So we have a manifold of optimal solutions that are in fact uh, connected. They are not isolated uh, from an, one another. So in the overparameterized regime, we have manifold of optimal solutions. Basically, we have infinitely many uh, W uh, stars. And then when we run SGD on top of it, it is easier for my SGD to pick a simple solution. A simple solution, for instance, a solution with a, a smaller norm. Uh, in terms of the uh, norm of the parameters. So it is easier, so obviously this is hand wavy, to find quote unquote simple solutions. For instance, functions with small norms. And therefore, this leads to better generalization. Right, so here you have infinitely many functions that you can pick uh, from. So you have a lot of flexibility. And uh, your SGD when you're running, and there, there may be some implicit bias, uh, when you are picking your solution, uh, you are basically biased towards picking simple solutions. Right? Solutions that if you, for instance, look at the L2 norm or some norm of your parameters or some norms in the function space, uh, that will basically be smaller uh, than some other solutions. And that will lead to better generalization. So this intuition is in fact uh, somehow empirically verified in the paper. Um, so they have plotted the, the norm of the functions computed in each of these uh, regimes. And you can in fact verify empirically at least, or observe this behavior empirically, that in the overparameterized regime, when you are increasing the complexity of your function class, the norm of uh, these uh, functions that you find decreases. And that's in fact the reason that or, train, or test error decreases because we have a better generalization uh, behavior in those cases. So that's how, roughly speaking, the intuition uh, that uh, we have uh, for observing these double descent behavior. Right, so there's a question. Can we use Occam's razor here somehow to analyze which solution? Yes, exactly. Right? So that's basically if you, uh, you always you know, want to find, if you have a lot of solutions, you want to go with like the simplest solution. And that's in fact you know, the intuition that we discussed. So we have a lot of solutions and SGD finds a simple solution and that generalizes well. So in some cases, you, if, if, even if you don't use SGD, uh, you may uh, like explicitly go ahead and find a simple solution, like a solution that minimizes the norm. But uh, the magic of neural networks and deep learning is that SGD is doing that job for you implicitly. And that's, uh, you know, at least that's something that we, we, we think that's the case. Okay. What does the decrease in the norm of the optimal function result in better generalization? So it's a, you know, roughly speaking, uh, uh, even from uh, the complexity point of view, if you have a bounded norm, you get a better uh, generalization, right? So even from results from the Rademacher complexity, if you have like a W, the norm is bounded, that translates into a better generalization or in SVM, you, we have the results that you're minimizing the norm of your W. These are you know, linear examples, uh, but even in the nonlinear case, uh, you know, that's the intuition that the norm somehow you know, correlates. I'm not saying it is causes, but it correlates with the complexity of the function and that may lead to some better generalization. 
So again, it's kind of a hand wavy argument. So I don't want to make it very precise. And in fact, we don't we don't know it precisely. Okay. Um, so function with a smaller norm. So just think about you know the norm of the parameters. All right. So let me move on. Let me look at the time. If you have, um, maybe you're on track. Okay. So let's see if we can analyze this behavior. Uh, for a simple model. So the question that we want to understand can be analyzed. We double the same the same curve for some simple models, right? So for some simple distributions and models. Can we observe it uh, theoretically? So, so far, you know, what I have uh, Argued is that yes, we can um, observe this empirically, uh, but can we come up with some uh, simple examples that we can uh, basically theoretically analyze this behavior? So as I mentioned, this behavior can be even observed in linear models. Behavior can be observed even in linear model, which is quite surprising, right? Before we, we thought that, you know, we know exactly how linear model behaves, but uh, these results show that in an over-parameterized regime, in fact, we can observe some double descent behavior in linear models. So we'll look into um, the setup by uh, a follow-up paper uh, by some subset of the authors of the previous paper and some new authors. Uh, Belkin, Esu, and Zhu in 2019. So this is the setup that they have considered. The setup is a very simple setup. So we are going to look at inputs in D dimension, x1 to xd. These are my features. And we assume each xi is distributed according to a normal distribution, zero, one. It's just a you know, simple uh, data distribution for my features. And we are going to say the labels, the y is just a linear combination of x's. It's a linear model, x transpose times beta. Beta is like a model parameter that I pick and for simplicity, I'm going to look at the noise-free case. So they have looked into the noisy case as well. Let's just start with the noise-free case. So if you give me X, I can compute Y. And if I fit a linear model to my input outputs, then you know, I can obtain a zero error uh, if I use data. <clears throat> so from this model, I have a training set. Training set is uh, <clears throat> has n samples x i y i one to n. I observe n samples, and just a notation. I am gonna you know put my samples in a matrix x. So I'm gonna put my first sample here. So this is x one transpose. I have n samples. So I have x n transpose here. So how many rows I have and how many columns I have, I have D columns. And so this is an uh, N by D matrix that I have here. So that's the setup that um, I use just to generate my training set. You know, nothing fancy at this point. Okay, so the learning setup is the following. So this is just to generate my training set. I'm gonna learn. 
So I'm going to select, so they have looked into different uh, variations of this. I'm starting with the simplest, um, simplest one. Uh, we are going to select P features. Let's say in a subset T uh, from one to D. Uh, I think this should be a small D. So the size of my features is uh, P. I'm just going to pick maybe the first P features. I'm not going to use all of the D features I have. If I had, if I use D features and, um, you know, if I uh, use a linear model, so I can achieve a very small error, but I'm going to use only P of them. And I'm going to fit a linear model. And fit a linear model to my data. Right, so what is the linear, uh, what is the linear model uh, that we have? So the coefficients of this linear model, let's say, is going to be B star. So this B star in the subset T, uh, let's just use a T here instead of a bracket, is going to be something non-zero. This is a vector in P dimension. But in the complement, in the features that I haven't used, this is going to be zero. So my linear model is going to be like D star uh, transpose times X in order to predict my uh, Y values. Is the setup clear? Uh, what, what is T, capital T? Uh, T is this subset of uh, my uh, features that I'm going to use. So for instance, let's say uh, this bracket D means 1, 2, 2, D. So I have D features right here, X1 to XD. But you may not use all of them. You may say, okay, I'm just going to use X1 and X2 to predict uh, Y. I'm not going to use my entire matrix X. I'm going to use some columns of it. Uh, the index of the columns that I'm going to use is represented by T and the size of T is P. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so the question is how do we achieve over parameterization here? Great question. So what is the number of samples I have here? Uh, the number of samples is N and the number of parameters that I have in my linear model is P. Right, so comparing P with N is going to determine if I'm in an over-parameterized or under-parameterized regime. Right, so if my P is larger than N, right, um, then in that case, uh, potentially I can achieve a very small error. If my P is smaller than N, I'm going to be in an under-parameterized regime. So note that here the P can be smaller than D the number of you know, total features, but if your number of samples n is small, then you are still in an over-parameterized regime. Oh, what is C? Oh, good point. So this is the complement. Tc is uh, basically one to d minus t. This, these are the features that I haven't used. Good, good point. Um, you are awake. I have a question. Yes. So, go yes, go how ahead. will the uh, like it be star in the complement uh, set will be zero, or is it like we are forced, like we choose such B star? It is forced, right? I'm just using these. Um, it is very simple. So maybe I go with an example. So just to show, let's say you have, um, say. Uh, uh, three features, x1, x2, x3, and you predict y, right? So this is beta times x. So in my learning, let's say I'm going to use only one and two. I want to use only feature one and two. So my y hat, my prediction will be, let's say, some beta hat of one times x1 plus beta uh, hat of two times x2. Since I'm not using the third feature, that's going to be zero, right? So beta hat of three is zero. 
so that's basically something that you know I um, I explicitly enforce. I'm just using two features here in order to predict y from x. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. So let me. Um, oh, I can keep this. You know. All right, so let me um, move on and I'll um, take more questions later on. Um, why do we select only P features? We will be more over parameters if we use all D features, right? Yeah, so we wanna here understand the behavior for different ranges of uh, P. So I think at the end, uh, you will see, if when you see the full results, that will uh, you know, be more clear. Uh, what we mean, but you know, this is like a flexibility in the learning. So we are going to vary p from a small number to a big number and see how our uh, uh, generalization error behaves. Okay, so again, just to remind, this x is my input matrix. X is. X is my input matrix. I have X1 transpose to Xn transpose. And I'm gonna define Xt when I'm just focusing on the T columns here, the features that I'm using. Right, so this Xt again is going to have N rows. I have the same number of samples before, but it is going to have uh, T columns, uh, basically P columns. And here I'm keeping only the features represented in T in my uh, columns. So that's basically the notation that I'm going to. So and for learning, this is again linear regression, right? Uh, machine learning 101, I'm going to use a quadratic loss to fit my uh, model to my data. Quadratic loss so what did what is that minimization so i'm minimizing over beta t okay so xt is my input data transpose times uh, my coefficients beta t minus my labels y so this is going to be my optimization okay let's first check the dimensionality of this problem let's see if it makes sense Xt is a matrix uh, n by p. So Xt transposes p by n, right? So uh, beta is a vector uh, of length uh, p, so it's p by one. Uh, okay, so then I don't need actually this transpose. Uh, so good. You see, it's always important to check the dimensionality. So this is going to be n by p. So you have p by one and your y is n by one. So for each sample, you have a label. So this is just a linear regression. Isn't beta n by one? No, 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 beta is the... Um, um, No, beta is my parameters, right? So beta, I'm using, you know, basically out of the parameters that I could have, I'm using only P of them. So beta, the length of beta here is the same as, you know, you know T, the non-zero betas. Okay. So it's a linear uh, regression in um, 726 or some other machine learning, uh, you know, other machine learning courses, probably you know what is, you know, optimal beta here is. You can just look at the derivative, it's very simple, you know, put the derivative to be zero and then compute the optimal beta star. In that case, the optimal beta star is going to be xt transpose xt inverse xt transpose times y. So we have actually covered this in uh, 726. 
right? So it's quite simple. So this term is called the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Pseudo inverse. And for simplicity, you, we just show it with this label. This is the pseudo inverse uh, operator of your matrix XT. See, like, you know, this matrix X is even not a square matrix, right? So you cannot, you know, look at just the inverse of that. So you look at the pseudo inverse with this following definition. All right, so that's my beta T star. Uh, it's gonna be like this. And my other betas for the complement is zero as I have already uh, mentioned. So that's basically the optimal beta that I can fit to uh, this data. All right, so, but the good thing about this setup is that since I know my underlying distribution, right, I created this data set from PXY. Now I can compute the exact generalization error for this case, okay, since I know PXY. Remember, the whole idea is that we don't know PXY in practice. That's the underlying distribution that generated the data. Here, we know PXY. Uh, what was it? I know my Xs, they uh, come from a normal distribution. And my Y is, in fact, is a deterministic function of X. But you can even add some randomness to it if you want. But here, we started with a simple case. Because we know the underlying distribution, then we can compute. the generalization error or generalization gap exactly. Okay, so let's see how we can uh, do this computation. So I got my beta star. So this beta star is computed from a training set. Right? So I'm just gonna evaluate this beta star in my population distribution. That's basically the definition of uh, the uh, you know the test error that we'll have. So over my distribution, my true distribution, I'm going to evaluate the quality of this beta star guy that I have computed. So that's basically this term. All right, but I know my y itself is x transpose times beta. Beta is the model parameter that I use to generate my uh, my samples so i have y is equal to x transpose beta but a beta star is something that i computed from my training set so i want to evaluate the quality of that in the population uh, setting when i know exactly my underlying distribution so let's simplify this so x transpose times beta minus x transpose times beta star so I can just factor out from X transpose. So this is equal. So I'm not gonna carry this expectation uh, argument so you know uh, what it is. X transpose times beta minus beta star squared. Right? So I just factor out from X transpose. So this is a number. I'm just gonna write this number times it is transpose. Transpose of a number, it is uh, basically the same as itself. So this is going to be basically uh, expectation of beta minus beta star transpose x. The transpose of that a number it is itself times the number itself, x transpose beta minus beta star. OK, so what is the randomness here? What is the expectation over? So these are, you know, beta is a parameter set that I've used, you know, to, um, to compute my um, y, it is fixed, and beta star is something that I computed from my training, and there's no randomness in it, it is fixed. So the only randomness comes from my x, x transpose, right? So this, these terms can get out of my expectation because they are not random. So what I have then is beta minus beta star transpose expectation, x x transpose times beta minus beta star. And what is this covariance matrix of x? It is identity by definition. Right? So this is what we have assumed uh, for the data uh, generation. 
So then the whole thing is just going to be equal to beta minus beta star transpose times itself, which is just the norm squared of beta minus beta star. So in other words, uh, it, we get like into a very simple expression, right? So the, if I compute a beta star from my uh, training and evaluated in the population case, the quality of that beta star is just the norm difference of that beta star from the true beta that I use to generate my uh, data. All right, and this can be basically decomposed because I know some of my beta star is zero. So in those cases, this term is zero. So the only thing I'm gonna end up with, with beta, I know for be, uh, the subset that I haven't used in my training, uh, that's zero. And for the other terms, I'm just gonna look at the difference between these two sets. All right, so that's it. That's the basically the, te uh, the, the test error that I have here. All right, so let's uh, see what, uh, what, what, what are these terms. All right, so this is basically depends on my model parameters that I have used. There's uh, no randomness from the training or whatever. So this term is easy, same as this term. What about this term? Okay, so actually this is, what about this term? So this time we have a closed form solution, right? So we have this uh, pseudo inverse of X, uh, the data matrix times Y. Right, so this is my training data and this is my training, uh, my labels Y, which is equal to X transpose beta. So basically I can write, I can simply write the whole thing based on what I have, right? So I have beta, which is my model parameter and I have my uh, training um, data, X and Y, which is a deterministic function of that. So I can basically plug in all of these equations and uh, simplify uh, my training loss. So this expression, the simplification in the classical regime, when your P the number of features that you use is less than n, the number of samples that you have. This is being analyzed in a very classical uh, work by Brayman and Friedman in 83, 1983. It's a very classical result. As you can see, it is quite simple, right? So it's, it's a, uh, you generate your data from a linear model and then you you fit a linear model, but with fewer features. So in the uh, interpolation regime, when P is larger than N, that's basically the result of this paper that we are discussing here. And they looked into simplification of this expression in that region. Okay, uh, this is the theorem that they have. So let me state the theorem. So assuming that uh, I don't use all of my features, let's say beta TC is uh, non-zero. So you, you, know, you are not using all of your features. You have some features that you are not using. Uh, you can, look at the test error in the population sense. Okay, so I'm looking at the expectation of my Y minus X the transpose beta star. So beta star is something that I computed from training and then I'm evaluating my um, test error like this. And as you see, we can simplify it and we can relate it to just the difference between betas. And I know my beta star is uh, coming from this closed form solution. You can just plug everything in and uh, compute uh, this term, simplify this term under different regimes. So they show if P is less than N minus two, this is basically the classical result of Brayman and Freeman, uh, that this is nothing but just the norm of uh, this features that I haven't used times one plus P over N minus P minus one. 
All right, so if P is uh, between N plus one and N minus one, in fact, the error is infinity. And it's not a big deal. So uh, the reason this is infinity is that uh, your uh, V-sharp matrix, uh, I'm not gonna go into you know, the exact proof, but if you think about the inverse V-sharp matrix, XT, XT uh, transpose, the pseudo inverse of this, uh, in this regime, the expectation of this is infinity. Right, so this is called the inverse B sharp. And uh, if you generate, if you think about this matrix, the values are generated by a Gaussian. Uh, so some eigenvalues, some singular values are going to be very small. And in the expectation, you basically, the inverse of it will uh, pull up. So you'll get infinity here. So it's not uh, very important for uh, or qualitative analysis. But what is interesting is that when P is larger than N uh, plus two, so here you are in an over-parameterized regime, you get an expression like this. You get, again, the norm of the samples, uh, features that you have used times one minus N over P plus the you know, norm square of the features that you have in use times one over n over p minus n minus one. So these are the expressions that you can uh, basically get just by analyzing uh, this simplified uh, expression that we, we argue. It's basically very algebraic, uh, some algebraic steps to come up with these um, expressions, not very difficult. So let's plot this. So if I plot this uh, in terms of uh, P that I'm using, okay, so when P is equal to N, before that, my uh, test error increases and in fact goes to infinity. But after that, I see a decrease in the test error. And in fact, this minimum can be smaller than the minimum that, that you have um, you know, here before. So you somehow see different behaviors. It is not exactly double descent at this point, uh, but you see the behavior, different behaviors in under parameterized, parameterized and over parameterized metrized regime. It is not exactly double descent. So, you know, what they have uh, also studied is that if you want to like see more like, uh, you know, behavior that we observe in double descent, uh, you can also look at other cases that you have prescient feature selection. So in other cases, let's say you have some features. So they call it prescient feature selection. Let's say you already know that features you know, with lower index, they have higher magnitude. You include, so here we don't care which features we are using in our learning, right? But let's say if you include features in T uh, by decreasing order of beta. Think order of beta J, let's say, the, the importance of the features decreases, you know, in, in a fashion of one over J squared. So the beta one feature, the first feature is the most important, second feature is least, uh, you know, the second most important and so on and so forth. So in this case, uh, you can repeat this argument and obtain a behavior like double descent. So you can uh, analyze it and you can show you have uh, some increase and then you have some decrease and this uh, is where P is equal to N. So you basically uh, get to see some uh, double descent behavior in this case. Okay, so uh, let me uh, pause. I see a few questions. Um, I just want to like, you know, keep the full picture and then take questions. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Someone has raised his hand. Uh, regarding that first graph, so 
One of the core things we stated about the previous double existent graph was that in the over-parameterized regime, the local minima often reached um, lower points than what you would find in the local minima for the under-parameterized regime. Would that yeah. still follow with this graph? Yes. In general, it is the case uh, that <laughs> the minima that you achieve in the over-parameterized regime, in both cases, they are... Um, uh, smaller than this minima. You can analyze it, you know, under which conditions, what is the norm of beta and star uh, mm -hmm. that achieves, but um, that's, you know, typically the case okay. in these cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, Tasneem? Uh, yeah, in the beginning of the uh, theorem, are, uh, why are we assuming beta transpose C not equal to zero? Uh, aren't we assuming uh, only uh, T transport uh, T complementary not equal to zero. Yeah, because if you use all of your um, all of your features, right? So uh, in your training, then you know you're going to achieve like a very small error, right? Almost zero error. Uh, so you won't observe these types of behaviors, and that's why we are assuming that you are not using all of your features. Your model is not, you know, basically the same as your uh, model that you generated your data, but because of the overparameterization, you can still achieve a very small error, even if you are not using all of the features. So this is a, a kind of a synthetic case, just to see if you can observe these types of behaviors that are different in underparameterized and overparameterized cases. Yeah, but that means that uh, T complementary will uh, not equal to zero, right? But we yes. will get some beta zero, right? Yeah, so T complementary is not zero. And that means, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, you have some samples uh, that you haven't used. So remember, beta star of T complement is always zero, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the model that I have in you. So basically, I'm saying is that uh, what I'm saying is that the, the, the samples, the features that I'm not using, they're actually relevant features. So I'm not using them, but because I'm in an over-parameterized regime, I can achieve a smaller. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Uh, um, uh, yes, go ahead. Ap, um, Apilasha, go ahead. So my question is, can we think of... of uh, like, can we think of regularization as a way of pushing my model towards over-parameterization? So, for example, in L1 and L2 regularization, you force your weights to be very low or zero. So, in some sense, it is like uh, I am reducing my, like, I am, I am not paying attention to some of the features and uh, does it is pushing towards over-parameterization. That's a good point. Uh, you know, you're basically saying that like effective uh, regularization, effective complexity of your class decreases. And if you have, um, uh, so it's in fact, you're pushing towards under parameterization, right? In, in those cases, uh, because you're reducing the effective complexity of the class. So you're going to the uh, lower end, you know, of your complexity. Uh, yeah, so that's like kind of the opposite. Uh, here we are saying is that, okay, just like, you know, use, you know, many parameters as you want, and perhaps your solver is going to uh, pick a simple model and that will uh, lead to a better generalization behavior. Okay, so I see a few questions um, in the, yep, go ahead. Um, I mean, but it's like we, re we use regularization to, uh, get better generalization, right? So not uh, necessarily. Isn't no. There some, um, no, 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 no. Uh, that's that's the point. Not as you don't you don't have to use it. That's the point, right? So that's the you know that's kind of a classical view, uh, but that's not the case in deep learning. So okay. you don't have to use regularization. It may help, but it is not necessary. So that's the point. Okay, so let me see. I see a few messages. Um, okay, so I think I have addressed some of them, and it's really great that you guys are answering each other's questions. 
Okay, so I think we are good. Uh, let me, uh, we have the one minute or two. Uh, just to finish the, uh, you know, this whole uh, 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 generalization uh, results. As I mentioned, there are more recent papers that you can uh, think about, you know, multiple distance, you can come up with, you know, some scenarios that uh, you have uh, different types of behaviors. But what is interesting about double descent is that that's something that we have observed over some uh, natural uh, data sets. So, you know, so far, you know, we have uh, observed some interesting behaviors, uh, but this is an active area of research, understanding the generalization. Uh, there are a lot of empirical uh, papers, uh, empirical, uh, you know, measures to see if those measures correlates with the generalization of deep models. Uh, so I would refer you guys to this uh, work that we posted on uh, the course webpage by Jiang et al. Who's that? So, uh, 19. That what they do is that they uh, provide some empirical evaluations of different bounds, different generalization bounds. They have looked into, again, VC dimension, rather marker complexity. They have looked into sharpness based bounds, like uh, pack Bayesian uh, bounds. They have looked into, in fact, norm based base bounds, you can just think about the norms of parameters or you can think about, you know, path norms or some other complexity measures, so on and so forth. And obviously, you know, let's say you, you compute some measure of complexity of your class, let's say that is mu, using any of these methods, and then you have like your uh, generalization gap based on cross-validation. And you want to see if there is a relationship between, between that complexity measure and your generalization gap. So you can look at correlation, but correlation may not indicate a causal relationship, right? So you may have some bound that uh, is correlated with your generalization gap, but there is no causal relationship between them. So they have also studied some um, basically measures based on conditional mutual information to see which of these measures are uh, better in practice. So they have some interesting observations. But my point here is that uh, this is a very active uh, area of research and we are, um, you know, basically scratching the surface of understanding generalization in deep learning. Uh, these observations that I mentioned, they're very interesting, but by no means they're complete. So if you are thinking about doing a project for your final uh, paper, so this can be a very interesting uh, topic uh, for you guys.